Hey, very good morning to my friends from Brumley Baptist Church. Hope that you're doing well and that you've had a good and a godly week to this point. Whenever you may be tuning in to listen to this particular Sunday school lesson, we are in the book of Ezekiel today, the 11th chapter, and we're going to look at verses 2 through 4 and verses 14 through 21, talking about a God who saves. There are some very interesting things in the book of Ezekiel. And we're going to dive into one of those specific instances today. In order to do that, we need a little bit of context. In chapter 8 of the book of Ezekiel, around 592 B.C., uh, Ezekiel, the prophet of God, got a message, uh, a vision from God, where he saw the temple. And in the temple, there were detestable things, idolatries and profane images and uh, women sitting at the gate offering themselves as part of the worship, weeping for gods that are not real, all sorts of bad things. Anyway, God tells Ezekiel, hey, we're, we're, God doesn't dwell in temples that are filled with profane bad things. And so God's going to leave the temple. And that was going to be a picture for the people that God was about to leave them and going to punish them because of that. And so in Ezekiel chapter 12, uh, God, Ezekiel and himself left the city. In 13, he spoke against the false prophets. All these things are going on throughout the entire book. Well, we're jumping in kind of in the middle of this in chapter 11, and we want to try to give some understanding of exactly what's going on during these particular verses that we have. Um, we have to see what is happening within the verses that are contained within our chapter, and that's what we will spend a few minutes talking about here uh, today. So um, get a Bible, we get to Ezekiel chapter 11, and let's dive in and look at this in three different movements today. Let's start with being called out. Ezekiel chapter 11, verse 2, 3, and 4 says, the Lord said to me, son of man, these are the men who plot evil and give wicked advice in this city. They are saying, isn't the time near to build houses? The city is the pot and we are the meat. Therefore prophesy against them. Prophesy son of man. During difficult times, God provides leaders, and they are put there to make difficult decisions, to say difficult things, to lead the people through difficult circumstances many times. Well, that's what the Ezekiel was there for. He was put here, as look at the end of verse four, to prophesy against them. Now, prophesying against someone is obviously not going to be a very popular thing. It's not going to win you many friends, but it is going to be a truth-telling exercise. Well, the truth here is that the people, the false leaders, were saying, hey, everything's great. Hey, everything's wonderful in the city. God is going to take care of us, and God is with us, and we should build houses, and look, we're the choice meat in the pot, and the pot's going to protect us and allow us to basically do anything we want to do. You know, we should just go ahead and, and live our life and, and just, just live it up, basically. Uh, no, that's not what God had said. God had said they needed to repent. They needed to call on the Lord. They needed to be in sackcloth and ashes and return to him, not build a new house and think everything was fine. The false leaders wanted to give them hope, but they were giving them a false hope. You know, God's word calls us to tell the truth, no matter whether the truth is popular or unpopular. We're still to tell the truth. And so that's why this section uh, is titled called out because basically these people were being called out. They weren't doing the right thing. They were offering a bill of goods that simply wasn't true. They were offering hope and truth that simply was not true or hopeful. God had told the people to repent and he would take care of them, but not to go on with life as usual. So first they were called out. Second part of the word is gathered. Down to verse 14, the word of the Lord came to me again, son of man, your own relatives, those who have the right to redeem your property along with the entire house of Israel. All of them, those whom are the residents of Israel have said, you are far from the Lord. This land has been given to us as a possession. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says, though I sent them far away among the nations and scattered them among the countries. Yet for a little while, I have been a sanctuary for them in the countries where they have gone. Therefore say, this is what the Lord God says. I will gather you from the peoples and assemble you from the countries where you have been scattered, and I will give you the land of Israel. When God had allowed the people to go into captivity, some of the people had been 
allowed to stay in Israel, in and around Jerusalem. And so the people who had been scattered thought, well, maybe, maybe we were the problem. Maybe we were the ones who God removed us and we're being punished and they're not being punished. And that's why they were allowed to stay. And the fact is that wasn't true. That wasn't what was going on here at all. And so God tells them, even though in verse 16, even though I sent them far away for a season, uh, I've taken care of them wherever they are. No matter where they may be, I'm still their God if they will still turn to me. God judged his people and scattered them among the nations, but he did not abandon them. The Proverbs tell us that sometimes God judges his people. Sometimes God calls us to repentance. Sometimes God causes things to happen to us that we need to repent from. And so there may be bad consequences, but it doesn't mean he leaves us. It means he disciplines us. He wants the best for us. Proverbs 3.12 says the Lord disciplines the one he loves. Just as the father disciplines the son in whom he delights. I discipline my kids not because I hate them, but because I love them. And so these people had, yes, they've been scattered, but he says, one day you will be gathered back together. I will bring all of my people back together, back in one place at one time. We will come together. I will gather them, he says in verse 17. So they were being disciplined, but they had not been abandoned. And I think that is an important distinction for us to make. Yes, to discipline but no to abandonment. God still had much to do with them, and he was not finished with them yet. In fact, he says in the last part of the passage, they will be sanctified. When they arrive there, they will remove all its abhorrent acts and detestable practices from it. I will give them integrity of heart and put a new spirit within them. I will remove their heart of stone from their bodies and give them a heart of flesh so that they will follow my statutes, keep my ordinances, and practice them. They will be my people, and I will be their God. But as for those whose hearts pursue their desires for important acts and attestable practices, I will bring their conduct down on their own heads. This is the declaration of the Lord God. Here's what's going to happen. What you do will come back to you, good, bad, or otherwise. Whatever you decide to do, whatever you decisions you make, those things come back to you. If you choose to repent and come back to the Lord, God will bring you back to himself. He will sanctify you and draw you back to himself. But if you choose in verse 21 to continue to pursue these things that God has said are abhorrent, then eventually God will give you what you want. And he will give you the results of those actions. He will bring those actions down on your head. This is, this is what God says, that basically you get to make this choice. God has offered. He wants to be in a relationship with us. He wants to be with his people. He has given us those opportunities, but the people had to choose. It's the same today as it was in Ezekiel's time. God has offered himself, offered him his, his relationship to all of us, and it's our choice. Do we choose to accept his offer of being a friend of God, or do we choose our sin instead and reject who God is and what he has done for us? The choice is entirely up to us, just as it was up to those people who lived in the day of Ezekiel. Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. It's embracing the assurance of God's promises. God promises to sanctify us if we will turn from our sin. Do we believe him and take him at his word. See, we're called to present the truth in the face of false hope. We don't want to tell everyone everything's okay when it's not. We want to tell them the truth about what God has said. Again, I've used the analogy many times, but if I went to the doctor and I was, had seriously something wrong with me, I would want him to tell me. Now, it might ruin my day, but it has the chance to save my life, where if he doesn't tell me, I might have a really good day, but I'll end up dying from that disease that could have been stopped, that could have been cured or prevented. False hope is no hope at all. We want hope that is true, that is real, that is grounded in the character and nature of God. I find hope in the promise of God's salvation, that no matter what happens to me now, I know that my salvation is sure, not because of me, but because of Jesus Christ. And since I know that, I'm called 
to obediently follow and worship God. And so are you. He's the one who gives salvation. It is our job to worship him with everything we say and with everything we do. Pray that you'll continue to tune in with me through this study next week. We will be in Ezekiel chapter 20. And there God will judge his people because of their decisions and their choices. And I pray that you can be here and join me for that lesson as well. We'd love to see you at Bromley Baptist Church. Any of the times we meet throughout the week, 10 a.m. on Sunday morning, 6 p.m. on Wednesday evening and Sunday evening. We would love to have you with us at Brumley in person sometime. Until I talk to you again, have a good and godly day and go serve your king.